I'm in the Karakoram Desert in Turkmenistan tonight and we're camping and gonna have a barbecue. You should check out our Weber. And welcome to what any Zoroastrian would call heaven, but what everybody else calls the gates of hell. The gates of hell was created accidentally about 60 years ago when some gas explorers set this thing alight discovering, well, gas. Rumour has it that the current president wants to put this out, so you continue gas exploration. But I got two pieces of news for him. One, I know there's gas here. And two, I reckon it's a pretty cool tourist attraction. I've seen a lot of things in life and this is one of the most surreal. I bet most of you have never heard of it, but over my left shoulder looks like some pretty solid sand dunes, but in fact they're not. They're walls from a civilization which at its height, some people say had 1.5 million people around the turn of the millennium, around the year 1000. Oh, if only these walls could speak. They would talk of great travellers and traders and names that have echoed down history, including Alexander the Great and Amir Tamur, otherwise known as Tamerlane. And they would talk of the Great Silk Road because these walls, these walls are an ancient nerve in modern day Turkmenistan, which was at its height, one of the largest and most powerful cities in the world. I'm standing what looks like an old sand dune, but in fact, it's the citadel of old Merv. Merv was built out of mud bricks, often unbaked. And you can pick them up as you walk through here. When you walk down here, it's very soft underfoot because it is fine powdered sand, which for a thousand years under many feet had been mashed with straw to turn into bricks to build these great walls, the citadel, and all the other magnificent parts of what ancient Merv must have looked like. I'm now standing in the gap of the great round wall that surrounded the main part of Merv and the citadel. But if you go back only a thousand years to when Chinggis Khan's son came in here to wreak revenge, the bones, the fibulas, and the vertebrae of the humans that were butchered here. And imagine what these walls were like echoing the screams and the cries as the flames burnt and the swords crashed down to turn these bricks and these fine buildings and this great history into a powdery dust that slips through your fingers. Let's talk about Mongolian invaders for a moment. In places like Central Asia, Chinggis Khan is remembered as a brutal invader. But if you succumbed and didn't fight Chinggis Khan, Chinggis Khan had a 10 point bill of rights, which was one of the first bills of rights in the world, in which amongst other things, he guaranteed freedom of religion, equality before the law, and equality of the genders. So if you succumbed, you could actually have a pretty benign life under the Mongolian rule. But if you didn't succumb and you allowed them to invade, they would butcher you brutally. We've stopped just outside Ashgabat to get our car clean because there's a rule here. Only clean cars are allowed inside the city. We should maybe think about that. It was initially a trading oasis holding on to the edge of the Karakorom Desert until the Russians decided to make it the main trading post between Persia and Russia. I don't know, about uh, 150 odd years ago. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union became the capital of modern day Turkmenistan. After independence, they decided to completely rebuild the place and get rid of a lot of the old Soviet architecture, building it almost completely out of white marble. The Guinness Book of World Records claims this to be the best white marble city in the world. I'm struggling to think of the second. The Lonely Planet describes this architecturally as halfway between Pyongyang and Las Vegas. Having been both to Pyongyang in North Korea and Las Vegas, I don't think it's anything like the two of them. But there is some of this amazing new architecture around. I think it's more like Dubai. Like a lot of Central Asian new cities, it is bristlingly clean. You could almost eat off the streets. The cleanliness is taken to another level when you realize what I'm walking through right now is not a hospital ward, but a street underpass. About 80% of this country is desert. There's a cotton crop in the north on the border with Uzbekistan, draining water from the Aral Sea, thanks to Joseph Stalin. 
but the main economic driver is oil and gas and it is the fossil fuel industry that is driving this economy. You do see in the capital here in Ashgabat a lot of money being spent and a lot of infrastructure being built. And like Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan has largely been led by one man, Turkmenbashi he called himself, the leader of the Turkmans, who died about eight or nine years ago and his successor, his then deputy, has been leading ever since, winning an astonishing 98% in elections. So many of the international observers do question Turkmenistan's human rights record, its democratic record, but it is delivering some degree of economic growth into a country which was a Soviet backwater at best. Like a lot of the other Central Asian states though, when you move outside of the capital, you can see economic development hasn't fully reached the rest of the country. I thought I'd come to the camel market today. See if I can buy a camel. The religion of Turkmenistan is about 80% moderate Islamic. When I say moderate, I say coming out of that forced secularism that existed in the Soviet Union days. It is challenged by radical Islam. Less than two dozen mosques here in 1991, about a thousand today. I'm still trying to figure Turkmenistan out. On the surface, it's very easy to say this is a mid-level economy growing on the back of an oil and gas industry. And it's easy to say it is a former Soviet Republic that hasn't made a full Western style transition to democracy. However, when you look more deeply and start to ask this question, when did the Turkmens have a Western style democracy? Certainly not the Soviet Union, not in Tsarist Russia, not in small Khanates, not under Tamerlane, not under Alexander the Great, and not under any of the Arabic traders. So culturally, this is not a country that demands that sort of thing. And while people on the street will tell me oh yes, they don't have Facebook and no, they don't have Twitter. They recognize those sorts of freedoms are not theirs to have, but they don't reach out and cry for them either. While there is an economic payback and provincial towns can have hotels like this, people see that their country is moving forward and experimenting with independence in a way that they want to. Yes, there are human rights abuses. Yes, there's political repression. But on the streets, there's not a feeling of danger. There's not a feeling of being in a repressive society like it did when I was in North Korea. Indeed, when I walk through the markets and you can happily engage and talk with anyone, we as tourists are a passing curiosity as best. We're not actually that interesting to them. But in the end, it's a country I've enjoyed, I've liked. It's got some great history and I recommend you come too.